Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, Monday, April 27th, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. Today's Space News is trying to be a good role model for all of us. It's sticking close to home. After taking a quick tour of the news today, uh, we actually also have a surprise guest. Um, so join us as we talk about Comet Borisov, Comet Swan, and are then joined by, Pe- by Dr. Patrick Piplowski, a researcher at Johns Hopkins University's Advanced Physics Lab, who, who was part of the team that determined um, how to use messenger data to study the nitrogen of Venus's atmosphere. Now, while unrelated to Poplowski's work, our first story starts at Venus. This world is uh, currently orbited by the Japanese mission. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce everything today, folks. I'm so sorry. Uh, The Japanese mission Akatsuki. Also called the Venus Climate Orbiter, this space probe is studying how the different layers of Venus's opaque clouds are structured and flowing. One of the odder mysteries of this world is how it ended up with clouds that flow rapidly around a world whose day is longer than its year. For every single Venusian day, the wind cycles 60 times. Now, to be fair, the Venusian day is 243 Earth days long, but this rapid wind circulation is still inexplicably fast, or at least It was inexplicably fast. It's still fast, but we may start to have the beginnings of understandings. Takisha Horachi of Hokkaido University uh, developed a new method to track the clouds and wind velocities. Now, the winds on Venus are generally driven by pressure and temperature variations as air flows from high pressure to low pressure regions, just like here on Earth and like we see on other worlds. Now on Venus, the temperature structure is particularly complex because there is a gradual temperature gradient from the cool poles to the hot equator, and then there is another gradient between the day side and the night sides of the planet. These variations drive massive atmospheric convection cells that form pole to equator and are complemented by a massive equatorial flow. This super-rotating circulation pushes the clouds in what is poetically referred to as a tidal wave of cloud. Now, while Venus isn't tidally locked to the sun, its slow rotation is a good approximation, and the work being done to understand its atmosphere will aid in our modeling of, well, what we think might be happening on tidally locked alien worlds. This work is published in Science Magazine. Now, from Venus, we turn our sights on Comet 2I Borisov. This interstellar asteroid has been a target of opportunity for pretty much anything that could point at this, that point at this sublimating form. As we discussed last week, the chemistry of Borisov isn't identical to what we generally have here in our solar system. Its carbon monoxide is... Um, in greater proportions than what we expected. Now, new observations, this time with the SWIFT mission, find that Borisov also has 10 times more active of a surface than a standard comet, or at least it did before it started to fall apart. Its total surface is roughly twice the size of Central Park in New York City. So big enough to be a large park, but smaller than a large city. It was able to shed eight gallons of water per second at its peak output, which admittedly isn't a lot, especially if you've ever had like a leaky pool, but was still really impressive for a comet. As it approached the sun, this water spray dropped in volume, most likely due to surface erosion, rotational changes, and of course that fragmentation that we have now observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. While still within the observing range of possible comet behaviors, Borisov doesn't neatly match, well, any category of comet we've seen before. So far, its appearance is consistent with it having a different formation history with colder temperatures and still to be understood other variations affecting how we see it. 
Now, as we've said before, we need to see more interstellar comets to understand what is, at the galaxy level, the oddity and the average for comets. For all we know, we're the ones that are weird, and Comet Borisov is absolutely normal. Now, while we don't have any new interstellar comets at the moment, we do have a nice, bright, regular comet to fill the gap that was left behind when Comet Atlas fell apart. Comet Swan was found in data from SOHO's Solar Wind and Isotropies um, instrument by amateur astronomer Michael Mazzaro. Now, if you noticed, that instrument's abbreviation is SWAN, and uh, Michael also lives in a town named SWAN, so this particular comet is SWAN's all the way down. This small comet is in an odd orbit that is tilted 111 degrees relative to the ecliptic plane. This means it's coming up from underneath our orbit, coming up towards the sun. And um, this oddy icy body is already bright enough to see if you have binoculars and might possibly become an object bright enough to see with the unaided eye. We just can't predict these things well. Now on May 12, Comet Swan will be at its closest point to the planet Earth as it continues its inward journey toward the sun. It will approach the sun on May 27th. This isn't an ideal geometry. We get the brightest comets when we see them just after they have visited the sun. But this does mean there is a, well, fairly good chance Swan won't fall apart between where it is now and when it gets closer to us. We hope. This seems to be the season of comets falling apart. But for now, all we can do is wait and see and hope that maybe 2020 will give us one bright comet while it systematically breaks all the other comets apart. Anyways, that rounds out our news, but don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break and bring on our guest, Dr. Patrick Poplowski. And we are going to be talking more about Venus's mysterious atmosphere, and in this case, the unusual nitrogen behavior that has been uncovered. So stay tuned. We will be right back. Sorry, it takes me just a moment to get all these screens set up. Stay there. Oh, oh, oh. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the interview portion of The Daily Space. Joining us today is Dr. Patrick Poplowski, a researcher at Johns Hopkins University's Advanced Physics Lab, where he works on a number of different missions and was part of the really cool new paper that came out that told us, well, nitrogen on Venus doesn't quite behave the way we thought, and which required a remarkable amount of fortitude to get from having the idea to use Messenger to actually figuring out how to use Messenger to do this research. Welcome, Patrick. We're so glad to have you on today. Thanks for having me on, Pamela. I'm looking forward to our chat. <laughs> so can, can you give everyone a quick rundown as a starting point on what we thought was the case of nitrogen in Venus's atmosphere prior to, well, getting to use the messenger data to see what the data actually said? Yeah, so um, Venus so back in the 70s and 80s was pretty extensively studied, uh, primarily uh, via some Soviet uh, orbiting spacecraft and landers, but also by some uh, launched by NASA. And in particular, uh, a number of spacecraft happened to have arrived in uh, at Venus in 1978, uh, in December to be exact, uh, two Soviet landers and a series of American probes entered the atmosphere and they made measurements of various parameters like temperature, pressure, composition, and it formed this basis uh, for much of our understanding of Venus' uh, atmosphere that persists today, uh, 40 years later, and formed what we call the Venus International Reference Atmosphere. And among other measurements uh, that they made were chemical composition as they descended. Uh, and in particular, a number of measurements were made of the nitrogen content. Nitrogen is the second most abundant uh, compound in the atmosphere after CO2. Uh, the nitrogen content was measured at a number of positions uh, during descent, but in particular, the uh, most robust and frequent measurements were made uh, at low altitudes, below about 50 kilometers above the surface. And a detailed study of those measurements led the Venus community to adopt a um, concentration for nitrogen of 3.5% by volume. Uh, and that number has stood as the the reference number that Venus scientists have quoted for four decades now. And and it was assumed that that percentage was the same at all altitudes, even though the measurements were generally grouped up at the lower altitudes. Yeah, there were a few measurements at higher altitudes. They had a lower uh, statistical precision and were much more widely interspersed. Uh, a lot of what we do in planetary science is based on something called comparative planetology. So we develop models uh, for one planet or that we understand, say, the moon or, or Mars or, excuse me, or Earth. And then we adapt those to other planets. So on Earth, we haven't found any uh, evidence for the major elements or the major compounds to vary as a function of altitude below about 100 kilometers below that point. Uh, things like wind and, and convection currents, turbulent mixing, uh, homogenizes the atmosphere. And we expected the same for Venus. So although that three and a half uh, volume percent number uh, was specified as being for altitudes less than 45 kilometers, it was widely cited as just being the number uh, for as high as uh, 100 kilometers uh, based on our understanding in large part of Earth's atmosphere. Now, I know that some people are thinking you climb to the top of a mountain and you're, there's sure a whole lot less oxygen to go into your lungs. And this is the difference between measuring by percentage and measuring by volume. Is, is that a correct under, understanding? Right. When you're on top of a mountain, there's just a whole lot less air in general. So not only is there less oxygen to breathe, uh, but there's less of everything else uh, that, that's a little bit less useful for keeping us alive, but is nonetheless still there. I mean, the pressure uh, of the atmosphere at those altitudes is correspondingly lower. Now, while we had those early measurements, they weren't everything we would want. Uh, ideally, especially where you have such a thick, thick atmosphere that has winds that are different at different altitudes, um, in, in ways that are truly remarkable. Ideally, you kind of want to just sample the whole darn thing, but we haven't exactly sent parachuting instruments in recently. So 
what kinds of ends have scientists gone to trying to understand, well, more about Venus than we can do currently? Uh, lately, Venus has taken kind of a backseat to Mars. Uh, there's uh, some movement in the community to, to go back to Venus. There's a few missions under consideration now. Um, but most of the heavy lifting for Venus in terms of making measurements within the atmosphere, the uh, so-called in situ measurements, uh, really ended uh, back in the, the mid 80s. Since then, the focus on Venus has in many ways been on making measurements from orbit, uh, studying the surface by radar, and then studying the atmosphere using remote sensing. And those techniques uh, have varying strengths and weaknesses. And in general, remote sensing is not a very good way to sample the nitrogen content. Really, that's that's pretty uh, established to be something that you, you measure in situ with like a mass spectrometer or a gas chromatograph. But those are difficult instruments to operate, uh, especially uh, when you're descending through a thick atmosphere filled with sulfur dioxide and uh, temperatures hot enough to melt lead. Venus is not an ideal place to make any measurement. So we've been in this situation that early on, it was everyone's favorite place to try and visit. We realized it was death and then sent Magellan to do its radar work, sent the Japanese probe, which is now at a very high orbit, to look down on those clouds. But one nice thing about Venus is it's between here and Mercury. And anyone trying to get to the sun or Mercury needs to rely on Venus's gravity to slow them down so that they don't plunge to their doom. So this was one of those things that you and your, the team that you worked with took advantage of. So when did you realize, hey, maybe Messenger can play a role in this? Yeah, so as you pointed out, uh, Messenger flew by Venus uh, twice, actually, uh, to uh, slow down on its way to Mercury. Uh, that saves fuel, which means we can have more of the spacecraft mass devoted to scientific instrumentation. Uh, and on the second one of those Venus flybys, uh, just before we started doing flybys of Mercury and, and eventually going into orbit, uh, it was decided that the, the team would use it as a dress rehearsal and that we would collect data as we flew by Venus uh, just to make sure the instruments worked to make sure the science team knew how to do instrument commanding, to make sure we knew how to process the data. There was no real uh, objective to get any science out of it. It was really just to make sure that the instruments and the team were ready to go for when we got to Mercury. So we did this flyby and among the many instruments uh, that Messenger had was a neutron spectrometer. And we collected some flyby measurements as, as we went with the neutron spectrometer. And we found, uh, we measured count rates as expected. And at that point, just sort of checked the box and said, hey, the instrument works, let's move on. Uh, one of the images I provided uh, is an image of Venus uh, during the second flyby taken by Messenger. Uh, it's certainly not the best image of Venus because the cameras were designed for doing science at Mercury, not at Venus. But uh, nevertheless, when you stretch the image, you can see some of the cloud features. And it really is one of my favorite pictures of Venus because it was taken by this Mercury bound spacecraft, uh, and in fact, was taken just before we collected some of the neutron measurements uh, that eventually led to us being able to constrain the nitrogen content. Is basically um, similar shades of the same color repeated where trying to tease out structural information, trying to, to tease out any information is certainly a challenge. Now, beyond simply taking this pretty camera image, what other data did you, were you able to acquire with that whole suite of instruments on board Messenger? Yeah, so all of the instruments uh, were functioning at some level during the flyby. Um, the laser altimeter was scanning the atmosphere. Uh, again, you're sort of making sure things worked. We were taking spectra with various uh, UV. So I'm going to pause you for a moment. Yeah. What was the laser altimeter bouncing off of? Were you measuring cloud tops, a specific pressure inversion? What? what yeah, it was pointed towards the planet and was directed at the clouds. Um, 
again, it was mostly intended as being a dress rehearsal of the instrument as opposed to making any measurements. I'm not even sure if they saw a return signal from the clouds. Um, <laughs> but you knew it fired. They knew it fired, yep. <laughs> um, they were also taking uh, measurements of the space environment. Messenger had a number of uh, instruments that looked at uh, the local ion and plasma environment. We had magnetometers. Uh, we had, again, the gamma ray uh, spectrometer and the neutron spectrometer. And of course, the neutron spectrometer is uh, the instrument that we used uh, for the nitrogen measurement. It, in particular, was making measurements of neutrons coming from the atmosphere. These neutrons are produced when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere. These cosmic rays, you can picture them as little proton bullets traveling near the speed of light. And when they hit a, a nucleus within the atmosphere, uh, they break it apart. They, they break it, they liberate the protons and neutrons from that nucleus. And the neutrons in particular start rattling around the atmosphere and some fraction of them escape. And we were able to measure the escaping neutron flux as we flew by. Uh, to first order, that flux looks like uh, the um, one over the altitude. The closer you get to Venus, the more neutrons you measure. Uh, you can see that in the uh, neutron count rate image uh, that I included. Uh, you see the count rate as a function of time, and it's fairly flat. And then as you get close to Venus, you see this huge increase uh, in, in the neutron count rate, and it peaks as we're at our closest point to the, to the planet. Sure. So this is, um, you know, this part of the story came later. So originally we made these measurements. Uh, you see the black data points. We saw that the count rate increased as we got closer to the planet. Uh, we realized the instrument worked and we moved on. It was shortly after that that we had our first Mercury flyby. Eventually the team became uh, heavily invested in doing the science that NASA was paying us to do, was to do the Fair. Mercury science. Fair. And this, this data was shelved for a little while. Uh, but at some point during that, um, Mercury work, uh, one of my colleagues, David Lawrence, came across a paper uh, written by uh, a nuclear physicist named uh, Richard Lingenfelter. The paper was written in 1962 and made a prediction that the neutron count rate, the number of neutrons escaping from Venus's atmosphere, would be highly sensitive to the nitrogen content of the atmosphere. This is because nitrogen is very effective at absorbing neutrons. So the more nitrogen that's around, the more the atmosphere absorbs the neutrons and the fewer that escape into space to be measured by a spacecraft like Messenger. So when we realized that there was potentially this information content within the Messenger neutron measurements we made during the flyby, we were really motivated to go back and take a closer look at that data set. So you have this data set with this beautiful curve, very little noise in the data. And all you needed to do was, all you need to do is always an understatement, is match this to models, which usually requires hunting down the person who has software that can be tweaked to do what you need. How much time does it take to go from the data to this kind of a publication? What was the amount of effort that you needed someone to grant you the permission to put into this? Uh, well, it always takes a little bit more effort than you think. Um, even as scientists, we're always surprised at the complications that arise. Uh, in this case, we needed to understand the uh, response of our detector uh, in the Venus environment, which was not quite uh, what it was designed to do. We needed to develop models of Venus's atmosphere, and we needed to find a way to convert the count rates uh, to those models. So we needed to understand uh, the response of the detector, you know, how efficient it was at measuring neutrons, which changed uh, during the flyby. So there were a lot of little things that needed to get pulled together, and there's always various corrections you have to make to data to make sure that it's stable as a function of temperature and orientation. So there's a lot of little things that have to come together, uh, none of which, of course, uh, we were being um, 
was our primary goal, we were being paid uh, to study mercury. And of course, we were making a, a large number of very important discoveries with these same instruments uh, during the mission at Mercury, which uh, the orbital portion was from 2011 to 2015. So this was never our top priority. Um, but we did uh, go to NASA several times, uh, submitted proposals to do some analysis of the data. This is common uh, for planetary science missions where the, the, the funding for the spacecraft mission includes doing all the science that the mission is uh, set out to do. So the messenger project included funding to study messenger. But many times with these planetary missions, we find that these data sets are valuable for things uh, beyond what the spacecraft was envis originally envisioned to do. And this was another one of those cases. So we went to NASA asking for money to do this analysis. Uh, we went several times and uh, that they never elected to fund the study in large part because the general consensus in the Venus community was that, hey, we already know what the nitrogen content is. It's three and a half volume percent. There's no reason to think it would be any different at higher altitudes. So why would you study this? Well, and this is a particularly frustrating problem because NASA, the National Science Foundation, journals who you're trying to publish your papers in will generally go out and find the people doing research that's in direct competition to what you're doing, who, if your work contradicts their work, they, they have a vested interest in, well, that not happening. And, and so sometimes trying to get through peer review, you can have an absolutely excellent proposal that was either read by the right person on the wrong day, and so it didn't make it all the way to the top. You can have an absolutely excellent proposal that gets read by the wrong person on it doesn't even matter what day it is if it's the wrong person and and so this politics goes into all the research we do and when you have a set known solution to a problem trying to get funded to explore that issue further can be exceedingly difficult to get funded to do now you guys found a workaround to, for which I am so grateful, and and I would love you to share the story of the workaround you found. Yeah, I mean, we essentially traded funding for time, right? I mean, yeah. we we first realized uh, that we had something in this data set uh, ten years ago, and you know, had we been able to uh, get a little funding for the project, I think we probably could have knocked this paper out, uh, you know, probably within a couple of years. Uh, we that opportunity didn't materialize. Uh, so we found ways uh, as we were doing our, our normal work to sort of keep Venus in mind and make sure that we were well positioned to do it. Uh, we also had uh, another colleague on the paper, uh, Jack Wilson, who received funding from the Department of Energy to look at the Venus flyby data set for a completely unrelated purpose. He was looking at using it to determine the uh, lifetime of the neutron, which is actually an unstable particle in the case with a, a mean time of about 15 minutes. Uh, he had to make many corrections, uh, had to understand the data, uh, the response to the detector. He had to solve many of the same problems we needed to solve for the Venus nitrogen problem. So we found that we were able to leverage a lot of the work uh, that he had been doing uh, for that unrelated project to check off a lot of the big boxes uh, that were in the way. We also had other ongoing projects to look at your data uh, that benefited from understanding this data set a little bit better. So we basically just kind of uh, did a hodgepodge of various uh, funding sources that were uh, related to using this data set to put together the pieces that we needed to finally produce these models and constrain the nitrogen content of Venus's atmosphere. And, and this is the creative dance that scientists get remarkably good at. And this is part of why networking matters so much, because you never know whose noise is your data and their desperate desire to best get the noise out of what they're doing will give you the answers you're seeking. Now, with, with everything that you did, um, what was the most surprising part? I, you clearly had this, wait, this doesn't actually match what we thought, but how much did it not match what people had said was true since 1978? 
Yeah, so those values uh, from uh, 1978, again, were, were three and a half volume percent and were strongly biased towards altitudes less than 45 kilometers. Our measurement uh, sampling those neutrons, those neutrons, uh, the ones that escaped the atmosphere were coming from an altitude of around 60 kilometers. So we were sampling a portion of the atmosphere that was uh, significantly higher uh, than people had examined in detail. And we found a nitrogen concentration of about five volume percent, uh, which is significantly higher uh, than three and a half. The error bars were, were uh, well within uh, such that it wasn't, uh, wasn't just that we had statistically measured something higher. This was a statistically significant discovery of this enhanced uh, nitrogen at these altitudes. We went back and looked at the original data sets that had been measured in situ by these probes. And we found that there was one measurement made uh, around 50 kilometers, which was similarly high. It was very close to five uh, volume percent as well. That data at the time had been due to something of an outlier and wasn't used to uh, determine that mean value of three and a half weight percent that the community had adopted uh, so, so many decades ago. Uh, but within the context of our measurement, uh, we saw consistency. We now had two data points showing that above 50 kilometers, the uh, nitrogen content was significantly higher, which again was well outside of anyone's expectations. Uh, the atmosphere, Venus atmosphere community expected things to be very well mixed by physical processes below 100 kilometers, that we shouldn't see uh, small changes, let alone a large one, like we're seeing a change from three and a half to five volume percent. It was quite unexpected. Uh, and I think uh, the Venus community uh, is still trying to digest the result a little bit. That's the great thing about measurements is uh, they often forced us to uh, re-examine our models and propose new measurements. And I think this is the kind of measurement that is having people reevaluate these models. And hopefully we learn something fundamentally new and exciting about Venus's atmosphere as a result. So I, I have to ask, do you have a relative or a friend named Stevie Poplowski? Uh, yeah, that's my uh, cousin. So he's <laughs> in the chat and he's saying hello. And I just wanted to relay that on. Well, uh, hi, Stevie. And uh, it was his birthday a few days ago. So I'll wish him a, a belated happy birthday here on, <laughs> on your show. <laughs> so what, one of the things that is is kind of buried in what you said is so there there was a uh, roughly three percent at lower altitudes roughly five percent at higher altitudes and the reason that it was expected to be consistent was mixing and so finding this difference says something very fundamental about how much mixing is and isn't happening at venus what what kinds of things now need to be explored that had just been ignored in the past? Well, uh, that's a tough one, uh, not being an atmospheric modeler myself. Um, naively, uh, I would say that the data suggests that there's something that is preventing uh, efficient physical mixing of materials at this 50 kilometer altitude level, um, perhaps by coincidence, perhaps not. 50 kilometers is um, the location of a persistent layer of uh, sulfur dioxide clouds on Venus. Um, I've uh, wondered fancifully if those clouds are related to this. Again, I'm not an atmospheric modeler, I don't know. Um, so in the paper, we essentially uh, challenged the atmosphere, uh, Venus atmosphere community, uh, to reevaluate uh, their models based on these data sets. And this is the cool thing about the interplay between observers and modelers, is, is the observers really don't have a, a log in the fire over which model is correct or not. They care about what the instruments tell us is real. And sometimes it's just fun to say, hey, I observed this thing. This thing doesn't match your model of our universe. Please go fix this. And to just see what crazy ideas they come up with. Yeah, for us, the fun part about this measurement was the novelty of it. 
Um, our team is uh, composed of a number of people with backgrounds in nuclear physics uh, because it's nuclear physics processes that cause um, these neutrons to be released and uh, to be transported through materials and be detected. So we use uh, our background in nuclear physics to take gamma ray neutron measurements and measure the composition of uh, planetary surfaces. Uh, we don't typically do this at atmospheres, so that was new. Uh, and we, uh, our team had never studied Venus before, so that was also new. So a lot of this was really novel for us. As you say, we, we didn't have a horse in the race. Um, we had no vested interest in what the result would be. We were just more kind of blown away by the fact that we could use this instrument which was essentially designed to figure out whether or not there was ice in Mercury's polar craters, and that we could use it to make this unexpected measurement of nitrogen content at an unexpected place, uh, Venus. So for us, it really was more the novelty of what we were able to do than it was um, trying to show that there was a specific value or not within the atmosphere and whether or not it fit in with what uh, what we would expect for Venus. And And this is where the engineering nature of so much of science comes into play because it's the, hey, can I measure this versus the, okay, I have this preconceived hypothesis that I desperately want to prove true. Sometimes you just want to see what you can do with something. Now, you work on a number of different missions, and hopefully that will give you some insights onto this question we have coming in from Hanny. Hanny asks, what type of mission would you devise to resolve this issue? Could you use a CubeSat? Uh, certainly, uh, if you wanted to repeat this measurement, uh, you could do it on a CubeSat. Um, the neutron instruments themselves are fairly uh, low mass, low low volume, low power, uh, so they're con and they're low data rate, so they're completely consistent with doing a measurement uh, on a CubeSat. Uh, I am a personally a fan of repeating measurements uh, both with the same instrumentation and as well as, as different instruments. I think that given that uh, we now see there's some something interesting going on here with the nitrogen, we should find uh, as many different ways to measure it as is feasible. Um, there are a number of Venus missions under consideration that intend to drop probes throughout the atmosphere and they can make in situ measurements with instrumentation that is now you know, 40 to 50 years more advanced than the instrumentation that was used in 1978. I think it makes a lot of sense to use uh, modern instruments uh, to measure the nitrogen content with a particular emphasis of including the upper atmosphere uh, to see if when we're, you know, in the middle of the atmospheric soup, if we, if we see this uh, same result and if it's consistent and how much finer detail can be pulled out, right? We have one measurement at high altitudes um, you can see on this figure that I included, this uh, Venus nitrogen altitude plot, this uh, shows a red line showing the Venus nitrogen being three and a half weight percent at low altitudes and, you know, above five, uh, or excuse me, volume percent at higher altitudes as if it was this abrupt transition right at these, this cloud layer. And maybe it is, but maybe there's more structure there. Maybe there's a gradient. We don't know anything about how the nitrogen changes as you go from this low nitrogen to high nitrogen regime. And I think it would be uh, really interesting to study this in more detail, particularly with some in situ uh, spacecraft and see what else it can tell us, particularly as we refine our understanding of uh, the behavior of the atmosphere through modeling. Now, one of the things that ends up happening quite often is we talk fast and loose with jargony words. Um, so, so we're going to take a moment to run down what some of these words mean. So in situ, that's just a rover on the surface of Mars is way cooler than trying to study Mars from not being on Mars. Um, so how with Venus do you talk about in situ? Yeah, so when we talk about an in situ measurement for Venus's atmosphere, we are talking about a probe that's actually at the location where you're trying to make that measurement. So for instance, the messenger uh, measurement, we would call that remote sensing because messenger flew by Venus, never getting closer than about 300 kilometers from the surface. So when we measured the nitrogen content of the atmosphere at an altitude of 60 kilometers, we were making that measurement from about 200 kilometers away. 
And we did that by measuring the neutrons, which reached the spacecraft, but had been born in the atmosphere, as it were, at that altitude. It's the same as when you use a telescope. You're making a remote sensing instrument. You're measuring light that has traveled a very far distance and using the light and the characteristics of it to tell you something about the place where that light was created. So that's a remote sensing instrument, a uh, remote sensing measurement. Uh, and then as you said, in situ is when you make the measurement at the location you're sampling. A rover at Mars is a great example, uh, as is uh, an atmosphere probe descending through Venus's atmosphere. I wouldn't necessarily classify one as being superior to the other. They have different uses. Mars rovers are a great example. They tell you an awful lot of information about a very specific site on Mars. When you combine the information from an in situ spacecraft like a rover with an orbiting spacecraft that provides you global information, it's the combination of the two that gives you really powerful handles on trying to understand everything you can about a planetary surface, what it means in context, how representative a sampling site is, and what it means when you talk about the global evolution of an object in space. And, and this is something that, that in practical terms, we're used to every day. We have weather stations at schools, in parks, at airports that by themselves are good. And then we have weather satellites that are looking down on all of our cloud cover and by themselves are good. But it's only by combining this vast network of ground-based data with the fewer in number but more vastly looking weather satellites that we're able to get somewhat accurate weather models of our own planet. Now, with, with our world, when we launch weather balloons, we can generally tether them to the planet, get them back. The high altitude winds don't buffet them too badly. But with Venus, to put something in situ with those clouds, it's in for a pretty violent ride. Can you describe the circumstances in those clouds at all? Yeah, uh, those. you're right. It's a, it's a very extreme environment. Uh, not only are you plummeting through an atmosphere where the pressure reaches over 90 times that at the surface of the earth, but the temperatures are extreme enough to melt the very things that we make spacecraft out of. And the atmosphere includes a substantial amount of um, corrosive compounds like uh, sulfur dioxide, which are eating away at your spacecraft. So when you're making a measurement at Venus, you generally have a very limited amount of time to make your measurements and you're doing it in an extreme environment where your instruments, you know, you've made a lot of changes to them to be able to adapt to operating in those extreme temperatures and pressures. One of the complications of the measurements that were made in, the, in 1978 was as they were descending through the atmosphere, uh, these probes, which were built like armored tanks in many ways, had little inlets to let in gas uh, so that the gas could be studied inside the spacecraft where conditions were a little more uh, benign. Uh, but at one point, uh, one of the instruments had gotten, uh, they believe, a, a little droplet of sulfur dioxide from a sulfur dioxide cloud stuck in the inlet, which uh, ruined a few of the measurements as, as that droplet was stuck inside. These are the kinds of things that when you're doing a mission and an experiment on another planet, you don't have the fine control over the experiment that you have if you were to make the measurement in a lab here on Earth. So you have to prepare for a wide variety of circumstances and eventualities when you design these instruments to do their missions. And you're always surprised when you get there uh, because it's impossible to think of everything. For instance, the little, little sulfur dioxide droplet that got stuck in the inlet, right? You can't prepare for it every eventuality. So you collect the best data you can, you understand your instrument as well as you can, uh, and you do your best, and often you have to go back to the laboratory to kind of look at how your instrument might have operated under a specific set of circumstances or do some modeling, or you really got to pull out all the stops often to understand these data sets. And, and this is where science is so much of an iterative process where we do something, we get results, we go, huh, where did these come from? And we go back. And, and when it comes to studying these worlds, it really is a, a multiple um, types of science get involved. And, and early on, you mentioned that nuclear science, nuclear physics, physics is involved with this. Um, our audience is really used to the images that are so amazing that we take of so many worlds of standard 
spectroscopy that consists of looking at continuum absorption and emission lines. Now, nuclear physics, we generally talk about in terms of what's going on deep in the heart of a sun, but nuclear physics, well, anytime you're talking about a neutron, you've got nuclear physics. Can, can you tear apart exactly where the word nuclear gets involved in this kinds of physics? Sure. Um, you're right. Uh, nuclear physics is very important for understanding stars. Uh, my own background is in doing particle accelerator experiments to try to mimic the nuclear reactions that happen in stars, both like our sun, uh, that are well-behaved, and in slightly more extreme environments, like when a star goes supernova. Uh, so I come at this uh, from a nuclear physics background. Uh, in space, nuclear physics is happening uh, everywhere. Uh, we're sort of sheltered from this process on Earth. We have this thick atmosphere and magnetic field, which prevents a large portion of the radiation from space from reaching our surface. But when you look at an airless body like Mercury, uh, the surface is fully exposed to the space radiation environment. And I had earlier alluded to these uh, called galactic cosmic rays. These are uh, mostly protons that are accelerated by processes like supernova and are traveling through our galaxy near the speed of light. And without a protective atmosphere or magnetosphere, planetary surfaces are exposed to this radiation all the time. The average rate at the surface of a planet is about five protons per centimeter squared per second. So it's a pretty constant rain of these little, uh, like I said, proton bullets that are hitting the surface of planets and in Venus's case, the atmosphere. And when you have a particle traveling near the speed of light, when they hit a nucleus, you know, take, uh, take uh, Venus's atmosphere, it's mostly CO2. So there's some poor, you know, oxygen nucleus bound up in CO2, minding its own business, and suddenly it gets hit by a proton traveling at the speed of light. That reaction or that uh, incident has enough energy to break up that ox oxygen nucleus. And the protons and neutrons that used to be bound up into the nucleus are now liberated and they're free to travel through the atmosphere. The protons are pretty easy to stop, but the neutrons, because they don't have an electric charge, they don't interact as strongly. So they can travel tens of kilometers through the atmosphere. Most of these are being born, as I said, at an altitude of 40 kilo uh, 60 kilometers, and they're traveling 40 kilometers through atmosphere to escape into space. So that's where the nuclear physics part comes in for neutrons. Uh, those neutrons also interact with neighboring nuclei and produce gamma rays by exciting other nuclei. Those gamma rays that are released uh, by these uh, nuclei produce element diagnostic fingerprints that we can then do gamma ray spectroscopy to measure uh, the atmosphere or surface composition, which was one of the other goals of MESSENGER that I was involved with. And this is where with science, we really need to look at things, not just with the complete electromagnetic spectrum, but we also need to get the particle detectors out there looking to see what particles there are to see, alpha particles, beta particles, neutrons, all of it matters. And um, some of our particles are falling apart while we're trying to look at them, which is where the whole time, uh, lifetime of the neutrons gets involved. So this, this has all been amazing. And this is only a small part of what you do because, well, planetary science, it, you have to hedge your bets, work on a whole bunch of different missions and have that delayed gratification of knowing the mission that you plan today might launch several thousand tomorrows in the future. What all are you working on today? What is that wide sweep of missions that are in your today and your tomorrow? Yeah, so the success of the MESSENGER nuclear spectroscopy instruments, uh, which includes the gamma ray and neutron spectrometers, uh, allowed us to really position ourselves well for a number of future opportunities. Uh, we are on the uh, Psyche mission, which is a mission to a, um, an M-class asteroid named Psyche. Now, the spacecraft and the target have the same name here. Um, Psyche is a class of asteroid that we have never studied uh, before through orbital uh, investigations. M-type asteroids are often thought to be related to iron meteorites. We think they might be 
remnants of exposed planetary cores. So imagine traveling to an object that allows you to peer inside the core of a planet that's now destroyed. Uh, Psyche offers that possibility as it may be a, a high metal content that would allow us to study a now disrupted core, which is a really exciting opportunity. So uh, our group is uh, very privileged to have the opportunity to participate in that mission. We are right now building the hardware, the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer for that mission. Uh, which is a little bit difficult uh, given uh, the COVID-19 situation. Yeah, you can't really be in your lab right now. Uh, we have key personnel on site and uh, some people come in uh, on off shifts to, to maintain social distancing. I, I was in uh, the lab over the weekend doing some measurements, uh, getting ready for this. Uh, we will be um, delivering the instrument uh, to JPL. Uh, well, it's an ASU-led mission. The spacecraft is being led out of JPL. And we will be delivering the instrument next year for a launch in 2022, and we'll get to Psyche in 2026. Okay. We are also building a similar instrument for the Japanese uh, Aerospace Agency's uh, Martian Moons Exploration Mission, which seeks to go to Mars's moon, uh, Mars's, Mars's largest moon, Phobos, and collect a sample and bring it back to Earth to study. Uh, but they're also interested in having that global context that's provided by remote, remote sensing. So we're building a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer uh, for that mission as well. And finally, uh, we have an instrument on the recently selected uh, Dragonfly mission, which proposes to, uh, well, we are selected um, to build a nuclear powered quadcopter. Imagine a large drone powered by plutonium that is going to journey across the surface of Titan, uh, flying to various sites and studying the composition uh, as we go. So there we're again having gamma ray and neutron spectroscopy instruments, but because of Titan's thick atmosphere, those cosmic rays that we mentioned before don't reach the surface. So we have to bring our own neutrons with us. We're bringing a neutron generator which we will use to activate the surface and produce uh, more neutrons and gamma rays that we will then use to study surface composition. So we've got a number of missions uh, in progress that'll keep me busy for the next, uh, well, two decades because space missions take a long time. <laughs> they, they do. You start, to, I'm realizing you start to reach the point in your career where when you hear such and such a new mission has been funded, you calculate when its science is gonna be returned and decide whether or not you're interested. Um, but uh, I think about Dragonfly uh, a little bit differently, uh, almost more of a legacy mission. Uh, by the time Dragonfly gets to Titan uh, and is staying the surface, my uh, eight-year-old daughter, uh, my now eight-year-old daughter, could could be doing graduate or postdoctoral work uh, studying the data that comes back from that mission. And I was in that position myself when the Messenger instrument was being developed. Uh, I was uh, an undergraduate. And it launched uh, my first year of grad school. And I was very privileged to join the project as a postdoc about a year before we got to Mercury. So I benefited from the hard work of many individuals who uh, contributed to building, launching, and operating that spacecraft. Uh, now I'm in the position of uh, being involved with teams that are setting up the same thing uh, for scientists to look at the data who uh, they don't even know they're scientists yet. So it's a really exciting opportunity to uh, keep the field going and to provide opportunities for future scientists as well. And, and legacy really is the right, wor right word. Today's instrumentation instrumentationists, um, telescope operators, and so many others are in the process of making sure that the next generation can keep doing science. And that's just awesome. Now, we have run down to the end of the hour, and before we all escape into the rest of our day, do you have any parting words that you want to leave for our audience? I would just say that, uh, you know, this study in particular shows that uh, when we, we build these spacecraft and we go out, we do our best to uh, formulate an investigation to answer these outstanding questions, but we also find these other amazing results, often unexpected, which prompt the next series of questions to motivate uh, the next spacecraft. Uh, and that there are always uh, scientists uh, who are waiting for these data sets to come in and make both the expected and unexpected discoveries that uh, hopefully keep everybody's uh, life interesting when they get to hear exciting new results about 
other places in our solar system and give us some sense for you know our place in the universe and how exciting science and discovery can be. And when those results come in, we will try to cover all of them right here on The Daily Space. It, it has been amazing having you on, Patrick. Anyone who wants to learn more about what he's doing, well, go check out those mission sites on the JHUAPL web domains. They uh, really are doing a great job at communicating what they plan to do already and leaving the scientists free to just focus on those science their sciences. So thank you, Patrick. This has truly been great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. All right. Well, we'll be sure to have you back. But for now, um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. And um, as always, this has been The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I wrote the beginning part of this episode and was privileged to get to interview Dr. Patrick Poplowski today. We are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. This episode will be produced by Susie Murph, and you can catch it uh, later today, both on YouTube and as a podcast. Thank you, Trekker Kev, for these sub, and thank you so many of you for giving the bits all throughout our episode. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you, your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com. You're what allow us to keep going, and you are literally what feed Susie and Annie. So thank you so very much. Um, that's all we've got for today. So um, I'm going to go ahead and find someone to raid. If you have any recommendations, um, let me know. Thank you, Veronica Cure. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, I'm still trying to find someone to raid. There is literally none of my normal raiders showing up right now, but we've also been having some technical difficulties. So that may not be that they're not there. It may just be that they're not where I can see them. Oh, bother is up. Okay, so that was a technical difficulty. Um, so... Um, Horizon Psy. Let's let's go with Horizon Psy. We haven't raided Horizon Psy in ages. Um Thank you so much, Astro Wise. Um, I will actually switch to dog cam view. Um, actually I can't write yes, I can. Okay, let's figure this out. How do I do this? The world is complicated. It's needlessly so sometimes. I have removed myself from the screen. You will get a dog cam. You will get bits. It's just going to take me a moment of trying to remember what button to press. Eddie is currently completely asleep on my feet. But here we go. There, there, doggos. Thank you all so much. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, this has been the Daily Space. We are here thanks to you. And right now, if you can't support us financially, we totally get it. The world is kind of on fire at the moment. Um, it's enough that you're here. Thank you. So wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. Wash your hands, stay at home, and we're all going to get through this together. I'll see you all on the other side. <laughs> Bye-bye.